So this is Playland. And you can see the view here. And it encompasses this area with Get Fulton. Uh, this whole area right here was all Playland. And of course, up there, you've got the Cliff House. And on the other side of that, you had the uh, Sutro Baths. Um, we have uh, here the, uh, the ride uh, Shoot the Shoots. And initially, the park was called Shoots at the Beach, not Playland at the Beach. It was changed in 1929. It was named after the key ride. Let's talk a little bit about the merry-go-round. This is a loof merry-go-round. It was built uh, and shipped here in 1906, almost 1906. And the reason is we had an earthquake. And uh, instead, because of the quake, they sent it to Seattle. It went to Luna Park in Seattle, where it stayed there until about uh, 1914. The owner, uh, the loof family, they did not like Seattle, they did not like Luna Park. So when San Francisco said they were going to have the uh, Pan Pacific International Expo, they said, let's relocate back to San Francisco. Anyway, uh, our merry-go-round had a menagerie, which means more than just horses, it had other animals. Uh, here you can see some of the uh, horses and, and other animals. Uh, I love this uh, uh, dragon on the front of the uh, uh, gondola ride or the chariot ride. This is Will Schmidt. Uh, he was a regular at the park. He owned a couple of uh, concessions. He owned uh, the uh, hammer strike uh, and whatnot. He helped to maintain the merry-go-round. His son worked the park for a while and, and his grandson, uh, uh, who's actually a friend of mine, uh, still has a lot of the material from that and he loaned me a lot of material for doing the book. Uh, next thing was the Midway. Uh, Midway is where we used to like to hang out when I was in my teens. And it was a place where you could chase girls and see what was going on and play the games of chance. Uh, of course, there was the cat rack. Uh, this thing was really a pain. Uh, you have all these cats lined up. They were lead weighted on the bottom. They had all this fringe around the tops. And you're supposed to hit them with a baseball and knock them over. You had to knock them all the way off. It was not easy. Uh, this photo was taken in the late 60s. I wish I had this in color, because those pants would have been fantastic. <laughs> I mean, boy, I tell you, we were peacocks back at that time. I mean, that was just amazing. San Francisco was a fun place to be. Uh, this is Fascination. So Fascination was a game, uh, a game of chance. And so there were lots of games of chance there. And in fact, Playland had what we would call legalized gambling. If you looked around, you could see here uh, Jameson Scotch, a little white horse up here, um, and uh, a few other, they all these different prizes. Well, if you won the prize, you didn't take the prize, you took the cash the prize was worth. So you were playing for money. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever played Fascination. Uh, you can play it today over in El Cerrito at Playland, not at the beach. And a uh, fun place to go. They've recreated a lot of Playland. They do have a uh, uh, number of the uh, fascination uh, stations. And it's a lot of fun. It's, it's habit forming. I'll go over there and play it for hours. Had the arcades here. Um, they had two different buildings with arcades. And uh, a lot of fun. Again, it was a good place to hang out. And then the, uh, the uh, firing ranges. So that was one of the first things they had at Playland back when it was, uh, even before it was uh, shoots at the beach, it was the, uh, uh, just a, a series of concessions. And it was called, loosely called concessions at the beach. And they called them the lead galleries. And the lead galleries were some of the first attractions there. Um, a lot of fun to do. I spent a lot of time blow, blowing money on those as well. Um, these are the uh, later Remington automatic models. You notice there are no tethers on those things. Uh, you could turn around and shoot people behind you. Safety was not a concern. People didn't do stupid things back then, so you could trust people. Uh, before that, they had the uh, model 1906 uh, uh, Winchester pumps, and I actually have one of those, and it still works. A lot of fun. Attractions, we had all kinds of attractions. Uh, anybody ever go to the model car raceways? There you go. That was fun. So everybody had slot cars back in the 60s. And uh, you could race against each other. Uh, this is in black and white. But this thing was purple. Gorgeous track. 
a lot of fun. Uh, and then, of course, you had Skateland. Uh, Skateland uh, was roller skating. Uh, kids from Polly all went to Skateland. And this is a uh, uh, page, couple pages out of their yearbook that one of the, uh, uh, I was going to say kids, one of the people that went there sent to me. But uh, a lot of fun. And then Frontier Town. So Frontier Town was set up for the little partners and cowgirls where it was a safe place for kids to go. This was in the mid to late 60s till it closed in uh, 72. And the park was getting a little bit of a rough element. So uh, uh, they, they sectioned off a place uh, kind of like Disneyland. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, so uh, George Whitney Jr., the son of the owner, George Whitney, uh, was employee number seven for Disneyland. Uh, when Disney came out to California to look at opening a park, he visited a number of amusement parks and he came to Playland and he saw that Playland was operating quite well. They were doing extremely well at that time. So he wanted to know, well, how do you do it? And he spent a lot of time there and uh, uh, hired away George Whitney, so or George Jr. rather. And, uh, just uh, kids loved it. It was not terribly expensive. I never got to go to a party there. I was too old by the time it opened, but uh, uh, I know kids that did, and they just thought that was the greatest thing in the whole world. Um, this is it before it closed, and it was looking a little ratty here. But you can see, again, it had the uh, Disneyland-type uh, frontier area look to it. Uh, Cookie Cube was another uh, attraction. That was a, uh, what they call a slant house. Uh, anybody ever go to the mystery spot down in uh, Santa Cruz? So it's like that. Every, up is down, sideways, you know, whatever. Uh, things that are tall look short. Uh, it was that kind of a thing. What it really wound up being, this was put in in the mid-60s, uh, mostly it was for kids to go in and smoke dope and get really high, and it was really cool. They had clubs, so Topsy's Roost was a chicken place. It was a place where, you know, 50 cents, you got a half a fried chicken, uh, you got corn pone, you got pie, and it was very, very popular. Uh, they closed that in uh, 1945, and the reason they did, uh, a, a lot of the uh, African Americans were coming up for the war, and they uh, uh, felt that, okay, this was no longer uh, uh, correct for us to be uh, projecting it that way. So they went with the Edgewater, which was a dance club. Uh, great place. My uh, uh, dad's best friend and his wife met there, and uh, uh, I was talking to her here just a, a while back, and she talked about how they love to go there and dance. If you look in the far side, you can see the uh, Bullpup restaurant here as well, which later moved over to this corner. The uh, Bullpup Enchilada was one of my favorites. So anyway, that one closed down because, uh, a again, uh, things have their, their lifetime. And they put up Barnum's at the beach. George Whitney was uh, compared to P.T. Barnum, and they called him the Barnum of the West. So he liked that idea. He brought back the Topsies idea, of little Topsies for eats. And uh, so again, they were selling chicken but he brought it with the circus theme. And here's a view of the beach. They were still parking stacked out like this. If you look here at how low the sand is at this time. So that goes in cycles. Uh, the sand will uh, keep pulling back after a big storm. And then when we don't have any storms, it'll start packing in. Uh, at this time, it was the surf club that was uh, in Playland. And the surf club was, uh, uh, a place that you rented, so you couldn't just go there, you had to go for an event, so it was uh, more of a venue than it was a club. And this was the family dog. Uh, Chet Helms opened the family dog there at the, uh, at the pavilion. Uh, he negotiated with uh, George Jr. to get that, and he would put in things like uh, Country Joe and the Fish, that only lasted for about three years, and the problem is they were they were competing with uh, other venues, and so uh, uh, they finally closed that, and then it became the uh, Friends and Family Relations Hall, and in this case you can see they've got the rock opera Tommy playing over there. 
the rides were a kick. So again, this is the shoot the shoots ride. And you can see how tall it was up here. Um, again, one of our cars, the number seven uh, trolley that went down there. Uh, that was about 70 foot up to the tall, top of the chutes ride. And here you can see the, the boat coming down. So this was a water ride. And when that came down, there was nothing holding that car in, or that boat in. It was just down, there were some skids here to keep it from flipping off, but other than that, it was a free fall into the water. In earlier chutes rides, some of them actually flipped. Uh, in this one, it couldn't anymore, which was nice. But this was about in, 1942, 1943. What's funny is you look at the outfits here, people are wearing hats, they're wearing coats, they're all dressed because people dressed in San Francisco in the, those days. If you were going out, you went out dressed. You didn't go out in blue jeans and a t-shirt. It just didn't happen. And here in 1955, they're tearing it down. The reason they did was that uh, the word was that parks were making more money off the smaller flat rides than they were the big uh, uh, keystone rides. Whitney said, well, it's a lot of money to maintain this thing. It needed to be fixed up. Let's go ahead and tear it down and put some flat rides in. So that's what he did. Um, that was actually his first mistake. Um, this is the, uh, the Big Dipper. It had the tallest drop west of the Mississippi. Again, 70 foot from here to the ground, but it was an 80 foot drop. Now, how do you get an 80 foot? Well, you see that goes right into the ground. So this went 10 foot underground. So this is at, the, this is at uh, uh, Fulton and Cabrillo. And you can see this thing, uh, this is the draw going up, and then here's a bunch of people coming down. The uh, fun thing about this is notice the lack of seat belts, safety bars, anything. You could stand up, and people did stand up. I know, uh, I have one documented case of somebody standing up. Uh, he was a sailor in 1945. He'd been out in the uh, South Pacific fighting the Japanese. He survived, he was thrilled to death. He and his buddy came to town, they went to uh, Playland, they met a couple of girls, and they were riding with these girls, and he was so charged, he was so excited, so happy, he stood up the whole ride until he got to this one overhead and his head, head hit an overhead beam and crushed his skull, oh. so he died. And you can see here, most of the tracks were flat. This one was banked a little bit. And you think, oh my God, that looks rickety. Actually, it was very well built. I've got uh, pictures in my first book, Playland, the early years, that shows the building of this thing. And it was extremely well built. I would say they don't have them like that anymore, except they do. There's one in Santa Cruz that is the sister coaster to this one, but it is 33% uh, smaller than this one was. So you look at the Giant Dipper at Santa Cruz, you think, wow, that's a big coaster. This one was 50% bigger than that. Uh, and that one is well maintained. Now, that one is in cement. And if you look here, all these posts went down into the sand, and you can see rot here underneath. In 1955, the state said, he was starting to rebuild this, and the state said, okay, but you have to put them all in concrete now. You can't just put it in dirt or the sand or whatever. And here you can see the, the track going underneath. So uh, he said, well, I'm not going to put that kind of money into it. And Whitney was getting a little old. It was 19, 1955, and he was towards the end of his life. He was tired. His son was working at Disneyland, and he says, yeah, I'm going to tear it down. So he tore it down in 1955 and put more flat rides in. That was his mistake number two. Then we had the diving bell. This is during World War II. This is about 1945. Uh, the first one in San Francisco was at the uh, uh, Golden Gate International Expo on Treasure Island. Uh, George Whitney was the master of ceremonies and in charge of the amusements out on Treasure Island. When he saw that, the guy that built it, he says, okay, you got, put a, you got to put one of these in my park. And uh, it was extremely popular. What this was, it was a diving bell on a pole with wheels that would uh, drive it down underwater, 35 foot down uh, in a big tank that was uh, 45 foot across. And it had salt water in it, and he actually had sharks in there. Uh, once in a while, he'd have an octopus, whatever they could catch. Anyway, the fun part about this was the thing would go down 
and then it would slowly go back up and people could see all these fishes. Well, that wasn't very exciting. So they decided instead of doing that, let's just release the brake and let it pop up like a cork. That was great. I mean, your stomach. I remember riding that thing and they, they, they get down the bottom and you're looking around and a lot of times it was a little murky. You couldn't see a lot and whatnot. But it was kind of a leaky thing. It just wasn't totally watertight. So you'd see water dripping in there and stuff like that and condensation and all kinds. And all of a sudden the operator would say, oh my gosh, He's, he says one of the portholes has given way. Hang on, we got to pop to the surface. He'd pull the brake off and you'd pop to the surface. Your stomach is still way down there. Uh, I mean, people would throw up coming up on that thing. It was fun. You know, that bullpup enchilada was coming up fast. So a lot of fun. Uh, so here's Marion uh, with a leopard shark that she's dropping in there. And she knew how to handle them. She was really good with them. This is her daughter, uh, Teresa, who's a friend of mine. Uh, she loaned me all her pictures on the, on the ride. And here you can see it popping up. And uh, again, uh, here's a soldier here. There's a sailor over here. And uh, this, again, is, is more towards the, uh, the end of the war. And another shot of it. This is, this is in the uh, second location. And uh, here you can see the heyday ride and the, uh, the Skylark. Uh, the Dodger was a fun one. So that was a uh, bumper car ride. And by the way, if you like bumper cars, one of the cars is actually over at Playland, not at the beach in El Cerrito. You can actually sit in it. It's a hands-on type museum and get your picture taken in it. So uh, I've been in there. And here you can see the various cars. Uh, this is one of the early ones in the 1940s. What I did is I, I found that I could date these things by the grills because they only lasted about 10 years and so every 10 years I had to replace them. And you notice they'd have different grills in them. So this is one from the 50s. Um, they did have uh, kitty areas. Uh, a lot of these kitty rides wound up at uh, Frontierland. So this is uh, Flash Gordon and, and uh, Dale Arden getting ready to uh, fight another battle in, in space. And uh, this old plank uh, ride here where the cars actually went around. Uh, after the uh, tearing down of the uh, Big Dipper, they had the world's largest portable roller coaster. And this thing was big. I mean, it, it's, it went a long distance. It wasn't very high. But it was a steel roller coaster. They could tear that thing down in one day, put it in a truck, take it someplace else. And you can see that, you know, it's kind of sitting on the ground and then going up and down. And that thing, I mean, to me, it was rickety. I rode it, but it was rickety. Here's another view of it. And you can see how far out it went here. Uh, these kids are having a great time. Uh, but this is a high miler. And this thing gets way up there. So you can see these guys hanging up in the middle of the air. I didn't ride that one. I, I don't like heights. And, and you can see, again, they're just hanging on. You know, there's nothing holding them in. Uh, anybody remember Captain Satellite? Yes. In those days, did they have a lot of accidents with those rides? Yes. They did. They did. And, you know, but people, we weren't that Sioux happy back then. I mean, if somebody got hurt, oh, well, I rode the ride. I did some. You know, the only way you got hurt is if you did something stupid. They only had one time where the thing, where the car actually went off the track. That was on the Bob's ride. And the uh, guy who owned the park before Whitney actually left the country because he was afraid he was going to get sued. And that's when he turned, started turning the park over to uh, George Whitney. But uh, for the most part, people that got hurt got hurt because they did something stupid. They stood up, they climbed out. Of the I mean, one lady was so excited when she went down the uh, Big Dipper, she actually jumped off and got a compound fracture of her leg because she just thrilled to death. So, okay, well, that was dumb, but that's what, it, I mean, people did stuff like that in those days. Um, this was Captain Satellite's uh, helicopter ride. He was on Channel 2, KTVU Channel 2, had a program there. And this was a trainer, an actual helicopter trainer. It was not designed as a ride. Uh, but he would take kids up, and then he would pilot the thing and go up and down. And in this case, we had, we were, it was a windy day. He was thinking, oh, maybe I better land it. And then we got this huge gust, and it picked it up and flipped it and dumped it over. 
Uh, one person got a minor injury, but other than that, nobody was really hurt. So, uh, but he felt pretty bad about it, and he apologized on air the next day and uh, uh, shut down the ride. So that was the end of that. Uh, this was the best ride in the world, uh, the Flyoplane. Came out in the uh, in the 30s and, and 40s and carried through all the way to the end of the park. I used to tell people I could fly that up thing upside down. Everybody says no, you couldn't. They don't go upside down. What I found was in the 60s, uh, they didn't want it to go upside down anymore because it was too hard on the mechanism. So they put blocks in them so they couldn't. They could only go sideways. They couldn't go upside down. Uh, a really fun ride. You could make it, you know, you could take the stick, you could go side to side, up and down. You really felt like you were flying the plane. It was fun. It was a riot. Uh, over here you can see the, uh, the racing derby, diving bell again, and the dark mystery dark ride. Uh, this is the heyday. This is one of those rides, it, it, it goes in multiple directions, so it's going in a circle, it's going up and down. Uh, if you're subject to uh, uh, car sickness or anything like that, you're going to really get it on this one. Uh, here was the racing derby again, and the fun part of this is uh, you really could race on it. It was, it was a merry-go-round of sorts. As you rocked the horse back and forth and it was going around, uh, there was a friction uh, guide down here that with enough friction you could work it up towards the front of this trough. And so uh, if you're rocking it hard enough, you can get up to the front, and everybody in your row, you're in competition with them to see who could get the furthest ahead. So you could win. Uh, they had the, uh, the Rolo plane over here, which uh, this thing could go every which way. So this thing would go around, and then when this thing would get up going a lot, then they'd take and rotate this. So instead of going up and down and around, you were going horizontal around. So uh, my friend Marv Gold, who works out at Playland, not at the beach, uh, was one of the operators for this thing. And one of his favorite things is if he got uh, uh, you know, a couple of smart, act, smart aleck kids up there or something like that, he would uh, say, OK, time for a coffee break. And he'd leave them up there and walk away for a couple of minutes as though he was going to leave. That would scare him pretty good. Uh, the other one is the Roto Jets. This is the same as the uh, Astro Ride at Disneyland. This thing fell out of World War II, and what it was, a German company was making uh, anti-aircraft guns. When they lost the war, he lost all his business because nobody's going to buy German anti-aircraft guns. And instead, he just put a, uh, a rocket on the end of the gun barrel. Uh, they still sell those today. Octopus ride, again, uh, you had a couple of cars on the end of uh, one of eight rides, and this thing would spin around, it would go up and down, and just, uh, uh, again, if you're out at the hot house or at the pie shop, you know, we could bring them back up again. And the Rockle plane, uh, fun ride. These things, you could get these to spin all the way around or spin over uh, as you go up. The control was inside and the Tilt-A-Whirl. Uh, this one had about four different directions. You can see the, uh, the uh, rail here. This is on a pivot here with uh, uh, trolley wheels going on this rail. So this thing would spin around. Again, you know, your usual amusement park rides do uh, uh, just take you in all different directions. And then the Fun House. So if you look up here, this is Laughing Sal up in the corner. Um, you look over here and you see all these white hats. This is during World War II. What all these guys are looking for is they're looking through the window because as you walked into this thing, they had holes in the floor. So they're hooked up to a compressor and the operator could sit there and pull a lever and blow air up the air hole. Any woman walking underneath, if she was wearing a skirt, it would blow her skirt up. They actually got sued for that as well. In 1927, some lady sued because she got so embarrassed when it uh, blew her dress up and showed off her knickers, she got $50,000 from them. They didn't change it. They said it was worth the money because it brought in the people. <laughs> so, and, and, and everybody knew that going in. So I mean, if, you, if, if a gal was wearing a skirt, she knew she was at risk. Uh, here's Laugh and Sal. So, and, and the question always comes up, you know, 
well, where is she now? And uh, the answer is, which one? Uh, during the period, we had four of them. Uh, two of them now are still in operation. One is at Pier 45 down at, uh, down at uh, the Musée Mécanique. Uh, another one is at, uh, at uh, Santa Cruz Beach and Boardwalk. Uh, that does not have the original head. So, oh, these are the walking Charlies go around. There are a couple of walking Charlies out at uh, Playland and out at the beach now. This is, this is the human laundry. So as you went into the fun house, you had to go through this thing. Uh, you can't tell it from this picture, but these things are spinning. If you were a short kid like I was, you couldn't even see over the top. You just had to keep working your way through until you got out. Uh, this is the joy wheel. Some people call it the record player and some people called it the turntable, and as it gained speed, it would start to throw people off. Uh, you know, this, this is wonderful for OSHA. I mean, you know, you think, okay, what's this thing doing? It's throwing people off into the wall. Um, you can see here the size of it, and then you have the walls. The walls were padded. Nobody got hurt. I think there, I, I read one place uh, in an article of some kid that broke his arm, and that was all in good fun. Okay, he broke his arm, you know, he'll heal. It's no big deal. Um, it, it was a fun place. Here you have, this is the small slide. And uh, the big slide was down here, and, or, or the giant slide. Uh, but uh, just a fun place. This is the top of the giant slide. And here you can see the gunny sacks you had to ride on. Uh, you really weren't supposed to take your shoes up there. So you see this kid, I think, has his socks on instead of shoes. No way were you supposed to have sneakers on. Yeah? I remember you, I used to get burn marks from uh, when you're sliding down so fast and your skin hits the wood and you Oh, burn yeah. Burn on your arms, yeah. If you, yeah. If you got your arms down there, uh, definitely you'd get burn marks on it. It was uh, five stories tall. I can't give you the exact length, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was a long ways down. It was a long ride. And they had the, the barrel of joy, so this was a fun one. Uh, this thing was turning and you had to walk through it. Face left, stand erect, and walk through. Uh, a lot of people would try to walk straight through and of course they'd wind up falling over. Uh, another chance to break an arm or something. Uh, castle ups and downs. This was the walkway that would go up and down and up and down and you'd walk through it. So you'd be walking along and then the floor would drop out from under you. Uh, you know, I mean these things, it's stupid, but they were a lot of fun. Um, staggering stairs. So you can see here one stair would go this way, the other stair would go that way and you had to walk up it. Um, you know, it could be done. It was a lot of fun. And then the laughing mirrors. There were actually two mirror attractions. This is one of them, and then there was the house of mirrors downstairs. Um, anybody uh, remember seeing the lady from Shanghai? Uh, that took place at, uh, at the fun house on the outside. On the inside, it was actually in studio. You know, they weren't gonna let them bust up all the mirrors inside the, the fun house. But uh, that's the only, only movie we have that actually shows Playland uh, as a movie. Uh, Unfortunately, everything comes to an end. Uh, it got, things got a little rough out there, and um, everybody wanted to make money off the land. The last day was uh, Labor Day, September 4th, 1972. They closed it that day, and that was, uh, that was the end of it. Uh, if you go out to Safeway, uh, take a look at it. The uh, tank for the diving bell, in fact, is underneath it. They tried to pull the tank out. They couldn't do it, so instead they just filled it in. So uh, the ghosts of the diving bell and all those sharks still live under Safeway. Uh, so they tried to bring it back, uh, couldn't do it. Uh, when uh, Jeremy Etzhoken tore it down, he did it without permits. The Board of Supervisors says, you can't do that. The land was developed 10 years later by a uh, uh, Mexican-sponsored firm who uh, actually built those uh, condos that are there today. So anyway, I do have a few books for sale back there if anyone's interested, uh, but uh, again, I don't push it. If you brought copies, I'm more than happy to sign them. So, well, thank you.